Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Kleinschmidt. Thanks for coming to my Julia Kahn talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about um, the package statsmodels.jl, which has been under development for a while. Um, I'm going to focus on um, progress that we've made and sort of developing a uniquely Julian perspective on the problems that um, stats models is trying to solve. Um, and also the mistakes we've made along the way and the lessons we've learned from, uh, from those. So what this is about is the, this basic problem that's common to almost every data analysis pipeline, right? So the data that you, uh, comes to you in a format that's often tabular, right? So a tabular data is a collection of named variables or columns like in a database. Um, and those columns, those can have different types, right? So you're going to have a mix of some numbers, maybe some floating point numbers, some integers, strings, whatever, right? And the problem with this is that the, the computational procedures we want to use or models, they need a numerical representation of this data, right? So most models expect some kind of numeric array, like homogeneous representation of the data where everything is floating points, right? So statsmodels.jl, one of the things that it provides is this um, formula domain specific language, which is a way of specifying the kind of table to array transformations that you need to do as a, as a prelude or precursor to any kind of computational modeling or statistical modeling. So this is sort of illustrate what, that, what this means, right? So let's say we get a table like this where the table has, um, here I'm representing it as a named tuple, which is in the sort of post tables.jl era. This is the sort of lowest common denominator for representing a table, right? So this table has three columns, A, B, and Y. A, and a is um, random floating points. B is strings, right? The strings Argle and Bartle. Um, and Y is gonna be some kind of linear combination of, of these features in the sense that it's a kind of a constant bias plus two times whatever the value of A is plus three times this indicator variable, which is gonna be one for Bartle and zero for Argle, right? And then four times the um, element-wise product of A and this indicator for B, which basically is sort of looking at the um, whether the effect of A is modulated by whether B is Bartle or Argle. Right? And so Y is going to be this linear combination of all these different features or their numeric representations, right? And what if we get this data like this, right? So all we get is the data A, B, and Y, and we want to know what the relationship between Y, A, and B is. Now, you know, the sort of classic way to do this is use ordinary linear, linear uh, ordinary least squares, right? Um, linear regression, right? And just sort of invert the, um, the design matrix and pre-multiply Y by that, right? So the, the, the trick is in designing this construction that design matrix, right? And so that's where the staff models formula comes in. So in the formula, we can specify that the relationship between Y and these other predictors, that's what the tilde means, is going to be a union of all these different features, right? So a constant feature that's always one, a feature for A, a feature for B, and a feature that represents the interaction or the kind of joint effect of A and B. We get a schema by extract from our data with the schema function, right? Which is going to tell us that A is a continuous variable or a numeric variable already. B is some kind of something else we call a categorical variable, right? And Y is also a continuous variable. We apply that schema to the formula structure that's generated by this macro, right? That gives us a concretely typed formula, right? So at this point, we don't know, right? Whether a is categorical or continuous, B is categorical, you know, how many levels any categorical variables have, right? So we need to apply the schema to get a concrete term. Then we can use this model calls function, short for model columns, to transform the data table into a numerical vector Y and a matrix X. And then we can run our computational procedure, which here is a sort of, again, kind of dumb, you know, naive implementation of ordinary least squares, right? And recover the coefficient weightings that uh, generated the data in the first place, one, two, three, four, right? Okay. So that's what stats models does, right? Um, and so in designing this package, we had three goals basically. So, you know, um, and these goals are motivated by this idea that Julia is a good language for these kind of infrastructure problems because it leads itself to packages that are composable, 
that play with other packages that are hackable, where you have sort of um, useful internal representations, right? That um, don't rely, that can be manipulated and um, and and sort of hacked together in, in new ways, potentially ad hoc, right? And also that are extendable, so that other users can build on top of your package as a kind of a framework for um, for implementing like, these kind these kind of things. Right? So. In this particular case, composability means that you can. The, the goal is to have it support any tables.jl table, either a row table or a column table, right? To support arbitrary Julia functions in the formula call, right? So you can call log on a variable inside a formula, and it will log transform that variable for you, for instance. Right? Hackability means that you can muck around inside the structure that a formula macro macro returns without relying on some kind of weird, opaque, or non-public internal. Right, so that if you make an internal change to the package, it won't break everybody else's code. Right, um, and extendability here means that we're providing a way not for just users to use the formula, but also to build more specialized or powerful or specific kinds of table to matrix transformations that are useful for other kinds of computational modeling besides a really basic vanilla sort of ordinary least squares linear regression sort of modeling, right? Okay, so just sort of some history in the development of this. So development in, on the formula started back in 2012. One of the earliest um, Julia packages was, you know, dataframes.jl. And so in, in dataframes.jl, we had a formula macro that would create this churn structure, which was just a literally a binary matrix, of, um, a Boolean matrix that would represent um, for every combination of uh, variable and term in the formula, you know, one plus a plus b plus a and b, um, whether that variable occurred in that term, right? So it could represent things like, you know, do we have a main effect of this variable? Do we have a main effect of that variable? Do we have interactions of these of these variables? But it couldn't represent anything else, and it was very specific, specialized to that particular syntax. That terms structure could then be used to wrap a, a data frame, which would give you a model frame. Then you could call model matrix on that model frame, and it would return the specialized model matrix struct. Right. So this isn't composable in the sense that it requires you to put in a data frame. And actually, internally, it made a lot of assumptions about the structure of the data. Right. That you had all the columns there in memory. Right. And then it returns this specialized structure of model matrix. Right. Which is a um, a wrapper around either a dense matrix or a uh, a sparse matrix, right? But it was, it's a specialized structure, right? It's not hackable in the sense that the internal representation of the formula, this terms matrix, is kind of opaque, right? Um, and it's also very specialized to the particular assumptions about the, uh, the DSL. Um, when I say DSL, what I mean is domain-specific language. The domain-specific language is the, like, the what happens inside this formula that plus means union of features and ampersand means um, interaction, things like that. Right? It's also not extendable because the domain specific language, the DSL syntax rules are really baked in a very deep fundamental way into the implementation of the formula in this terms struct. So there's really no other, there's no way to, to easily add um, additional special syntax, right? Okay. Now, the next step in the development of this package was um, in uh, around 2018, um, where there was, uh, I made this pull request, terms 2.0, son of terms, um, talked about it at JuliaCon 2018, right? And that proposed a different architecture where you take a formula, you create abstract terms out of that formula, right? Or the formula, rather, is a set of abstract terms. You apply a schema to that based on a schema that you extract from the data or you bring manually with you, right? Or you construct manually. You pass that concrete formula or those concrete terms, rather, through the model columns function, given a row from the table or the entire table. And that returns some abstract array or a tuple of abstract arrays, okay? So this is composable in the sense that it takes in a table, um, it spits out an array. Arbitrary functions mostly work inside a formula in this, in this structure. It's hackable in the sense that everything here is an abstract term. Even the schema is basically just a dictionary mapping one type of abstract term to another type of abstract term, right? Um, whether or not it's extendable um, uh, is sort of tricky. So 
in this proposal, there are mechanisms for extending it, which I'll talk about, but they actually don't work very well. And the reason they don't work very well is that anyone can claim any syntax, any you know, function call they want as special at any point. Um, and it's kind of a you know, Lord of the Flies, uh, every person for themselves uh, battle to see who can control the, um, the syntax, right? Okay, so at this point, um, what we're working on and have been working on is sort of fixing the mistakes and implementing this um, uh, extension of the formula syntax. That's why it took an entire year, basically, for this pull request to be, um, to be uh, merged. Um, and starting to think about performance again. So you notice that I did not put performance or fast as one of the sort of desiderata on that list of goals for this project. Part of the reason is that um, doing this transformation is not often the bottleneck in your computational procedure. Sometimes it could be, right? Um, but it's not a huge priority. The other thing is that um, uh, okay, so let's talk about now the sort of progress toward these goals of composable, hackable, and extendable, right? So like I said before, this is composable. The current system is composable in the sense that it takes any table.jl data source in and returns arrays, right? Both column-oriented, or a named tuple of vector table, right? And row-oriented table, or a vector of named tuples, where you're iterating over single rows in the table. Now, there's a little caveat there, which is that the um, support for row-oriented tables isn't necessarily complete because when you extract the schema, it converts everything into, internally into a column field. That's not an intrinsic limitation of the package. That's just a thing that we haven't gotten around to implementing yet. So um, would we, we would like help with that. Uh, if anybody would like to um, uh, know more about that, come talk to me. OK. So to sort of illustrate the power that comes along with this composability, where you're taking in a common data structure and you're outputting a common data structure has a minimal API surface, I want to talk about, I want to show you a really quick example of how you can compose stats models and another package called online stats.jl, which is a really wonderful package which provides these order one memory online data processing algorithms, right? So if you have your data that's larger than can fit in memory, you obviously can't process it as assuming you have the full columns of your table or the full design matrix all at once, right? Um, so just to sort of show an example here, this is a, a, an example where we have, we have two continuous variables, right? We're going to construct a linear combination out of those variables, right? This is basically an example that comes, I think, out of the online stats.jl documentation, right? And we can fit a linear regression over this lazy iterator, right? Which is iterating a single row of the design matrix X, which is a numerical matrix, right? Um, coupled with a single value of the outcome variable. Right? And you can fit a linear regression. So you're not, now we're not doing the sort of, you know, the, the sort of dumb, naive, linear, ordinarily squares where we say um, x backslash y. We're doing something online, right, that only requires you have one, you observe one value at a time, right? And we can recover the, co the coefficient values that generated this data, one, two, three. But what if your data has, so this, so this, is, this works great, right? Because you have like, um, you can run this on out of core data sets and data sets where you don't actually even have all the data all at once. Let's say you're running some kind of service and you're getting data in in batches or, or one observation at a time. But what if your data has things like, uh, it's in a table, right? So it does not, so here we already have a matrix to begin with, right? has strings in that table maybe, um, or you need like nonlinear transformations or interactions between features, right? So this code here is literally all you need to wrap any online stat in uh, a formula, basically, right? So we're plugging into the online stat space API where we define a fit method for our wrapper and a value method. The value actually isn't really necessary. Um, well, it's necessary in the sense that the, the default doesn't work, but this, this is just some fanciness to sort of like, if the value looks like a coefficient vector, we apply the coefficient names from the formula to that and create a named tuple to return. So we get a kind of a nice format for the output, right? Okay. Um, okay. So now that we have this wrapper, right, we can, if we have a table, right, and it has the same structure, right? So we have the 
values for y, a, and b, but now they're separate vectors that are stored in this table, right? And we're just going to we're going to create a row table which is iterating rows. So each each row that you get out of this iterator is this named tuple like this, where I have one value for y, one for a, one for b, right? So now we can create a formula, right, where y depends on a uh, constant term a and b. Apply a schema to that, right? Create this formulated wrapper. We're wrapping the linear regression online stat in f and fit that to the rows. And now we get back a value that says, we get the coefficient values back again, one, two, and three, right? But we have these nice labels for them that says that this, this coefficient value is for the intercept, this coefficient is for a, and this is for b, right? And didn't have to do any sort of mucking about with uh, uh, mapping the numeric uh, um, covariates onto, onto a matrix, stats models would handle that for us, right? So this works even if you have categorical variables or like strings. So, so now we're gonna, now I've replaced B with this argle bargle strings repeated over and over again, right? In our data generating process, we have to manually construct an indicator variable, but when we're actually fitting it, we don't have to do any of that, right? We just sort of apply a schema to the formula again. Now notice the formula is the same, Y depends on one, A, and B, but because the data has changed, B is now a string, it's a categorical variable, that's going to give us a different, different set of predictors and a different set of numerical uh, columns in the model matrix. And it also gives us, we see an output, right, that now we're going to get a coefficient for B that's specific to the effect of Bargle over Argle. Right? So stats models, again, sort of handle all this for us. Okay. We can do it even when we have interactions between the um, between continuous and categorical variables. So this one's probably getting cut off by my face, but you know, you're getting a, uh, um, a coefficient for the interaction between A and the indicator for Bartle, right? And we can even do it if we have a link function that connects the linear part of this relationship with the outcome variable. So now in our data generating process, we're exponentiating the linear combination, right? And in fitting it, we want to undo that by, by taking the log of the dependent variable, right? And this is going to happen lazily, one row at a time, right? So you don't have to log transform that variable ahead of time, right? You can iterate rows out of your table where these y values are these exponentiated linear combinations of the a and b and their interaction, and undo that lazily, one row at a time. So this is where the sort of the power of the, the composability of stats models and online stats come in, right? So because we designed stats models to treat row tables and iterate a single row at a time as first class citizens, right? It just works. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend as much time talking about the hackability. I just want to sort of show some quick examples, right? The basic of it, I think, idea of this is that everything in stats models and the formula DSL is an abstract term, including the formula term itself. So when you call formula, it returns a formula term, right? Okay. And any abstract term can transform a table or a row into uh, an array via model calls, right? So we can pull out the left-hand side, which is just this Y term, and call model calls on it. This is, I'm now seeing getting cut off at the bottom of my slides. Um, but trust me that this just returns a numerical vector for Y. Okay. And through the magic of multiple dispatch, we can combine terms into higher order terms with normal Julia functions, right? So we can extract the right-hand side terms of this formula, of this formula, right? combine the A and the B term into a new interaction term, right? And stick that new interaction term back into the formula, creating a new formula, right? And then call model calls on that. And we get the same thing that we would get if we had constructed this, this formula by saying one plus A plus B plus A and B in the first place, right? So this is a really powerful way to, um, to construct terms at runtime, right? And in fact, you can actually create your own little functions that given a vector of symbols, say, will construct any formula you like, right? So this is what I mean by hackable, right? So you can just sort of create this little one-off function, build f, that will build a formula to whatever specification you like based on whatever needs you have. So let's say you're, you wanna run some automatic model comparison and you have a bunch of features, right? So you can write a, you can write a function that iterates through subsets of the, of the features you have, constructs a formula, fits a model, gets a goodness of fit, right? Puts that into a, some algorithm to select the best fitting model. Okay, so now I want to talk about the sort of question of extendability. So in the original proposal from 2018, from Terms 2.0, Son of Terms, um, extendability happened by um, 
overloading the interpretation of calls to non-standard or non-special functions, right? So let's say we have a function like poly. We want to use this poly function to do like polynomial basis construction, right? So you can, you can extend this by um, inside the macro parser by overloading E special. You can do it immediately after macro evaluation using overloading this capture call, which dispatches on the type of the function. And you can do it at the time when you apply the schema by, by dispatching on this um, function term struct, which is, the, in, which is the, um, the term type that's created when you encounter a non-standard non DSL call like poly. Okay. The problem with this proposal is that it doesn't tell you who owns poly in this formula, right? So, and this can be this could be a problem if you have two packages that want to have want to claim this poly function as a, um, as a as a special function in their package, or God forbid, want to claim a function from base, right? Like this caret function. So poly is not a function in the base, but you know caret is. So what happens if two different packages overload capture call for type of caret in two different ways? Then you're sort of like, who knows what will happen? It'll depend on who which package gets loaded first, right? Okay. So the current solution we settled on after a lot of thought and debate um, and sort of banging of heads against walls is to use multiple dispatch and to use it in a specific way. We're dispatching now on, at the schema application numbers, we're dispatching on the, um, the type of the function, we're dispatching on the schema itself, and we're also dispatching critically on this third kind of context um, model argument. So this is, this is sort of saying, I'm gonna, I'm going to be using this formula for, to fit this type of model, right? And this type could be any, it could be nothing, you can do whatever you want, right? But the point is you have to say the context in which this special syntax applies, right? So in this example of this, I want to show you how mixedmodels.jl um, uses this to extend the interpretation of this pipe function, right? To represent random effects terms, and um, don't you don't have to worry too much about what that means, but 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 just have to know that it is essentially we're fitting these sort of sub models um, group wise in a, in a kind of fancy way. Okay, so there's three parts to this. The first part is a, a special term to represent the um, the syntax. So we have a random effects term structure that holds a left hand side, a right hand side. Okay. You define a method for apply schema, right? That takes in a function term with the type of the special syntax you want to overload and returns a different type of specialized term, right? So here, in this case, a random effects term in the specialized context, right? So this is this will only happen if you're trying to fit a mixed model. And then finally, you need a method for actually creating the numeric representation, the specialized numeric representation of this. So in, in mixed models, this is a specialized structure called a, a, an REMAT that, that takes advantage of some of the, um, the special structure of the, uh, of the regression problem to create an efficient sort of sparse uh, representation. Now, mixed models goes way beyond this actually and takes um, overloads a bunch of other things too. So it overloads this slash to represent kind of nesting so that you can nest groups within other groups. Um, it also defines special functions like zero core and full dummy, which are important for controlling the variance covariance structure in these uh, in in the groups. Right. Okay, so I think this is actually really uh, you know when we hit on this solution it it. it it wasn't obvious at first, but I think it actually is, is, is quite elegant because it, it relies on the normal Julia mechanisms for adjudicating disputes between packages about who owns a particular function or a particular method of function and, and type signatures, right? So you could, you could define a very wide context type where your syntax applies, but then it can be easily overruled if somebody comes along and defines a a narrower type that applies only to their specific model, right? And you, of course, you can always steal syntax, right? So you, there's nothing stopping you in your package from defining a method for uh, a, a function term for a base function um, and a type, a model type that somebody, some other package creates. Right? But again, that's type piracy, right? That's a thing that we are aware of in the Julia community. We sort of know how to work around that. So this takes this sort of thorny problem of creating custom DSLs and lowers it down to a place where the sort of normal Julia mental model of multiple dispatch and working together across packages um, 
can work, right? Okay, so I wanna talk just in the last couple minutes about some mistakes we made, um, and I think that are still sort of outstanding problems. So one is that there's this conflicting pressure to move stuff out of the macro to make it more useful at runtime. But the problem is you end up in defining a lot of methods, overloading a lot of base functions, stuff like that, that it can it end up taxing the compiler unless you're really careful. This is still a problem. This is, I think, sort of the biggest problem with the current implementation. Um, another mistake is that three-way dispatch is hard. You end up with a lot of method ambiguity. It's not always clear um, how to, where to specialize things, just from a design perspective. Uh, I think the biggest outstanding design issue is that the context only comes in at the very last stage of that pipeline before you're actually generating the arrays. It comes in at the apply schema stage. And what this means is that there's no context aware way of generating the schema based on the data. And this is a problem because you might, in a mixed model, have a grouping variable that has like 100,000 or a million levels. We can fit models like that now, right? But when you when the, the, what the scheme is trying to do is construct a contrast matrix, which is a sort of a you know, k by k minus one dense matrix. So if you do that with a, with a grouping variable that has 100,000 or a million levels, you're gonna get an out of memory error, right? And there's no way to, without manual intervention, tell the schema function that you don't need to construct that whole matrix, right? But you still, need to, you still wanna know what the unique levels of that variable are. Also things like if you wanna fit like a spline basis, that needs more information than the default extractor extracts uh, or could be expected to extract, right? You want to know something like, you know, where are good places to put the knots in my splines, which is basically a, um, the, the quantiles of the data. And extracting the quantiles of the data is like, you know, you know, you need to know how many quantiles you're trying to extract, things like that. So it's not something that you can do without knowing the kind of context that you're going to be using the, the model in. Okay, the last thing is like, <laughs> what the hell happened to performance? Um, so uh, performance on this system is frankly not as good as it should be. And a big part of that is that we're hitting the compiler really, really hard. Um, because if you look at the type of the structure that's returned by this formula, there are type parameters here for every single one of the subparts of this, right? So this is a formula term that has a term on the left side, a term on the right, a tuple of terms on the right side is a constant term, a term, a term, a term. You'll see a whole bunch of interaction here that actually just intentionally let it run off the screen because it's like one of these horrible type signatures. Okay, so in the future, we're trying to get rid of as many of the type parameters as we can, um, not abuse the compiler so much. Um, we're, look, we're looking into better representations of non-special uh, calls, so the function term. Um, we want to make row-wise table support first class, right? So the biggest thing for this, big two biggest things here are like online or parallel schema extraction and an in-place uh, model calls methods. Um, and finally, we want to uh, have some mechanism for allow context-aware schema creation. This is more of a design issue. We don't really quite know how to resolve that at this point. Okay. And finally, we, we need to sort of settle on the actual modeling API. I haven't, t I haven't talked to you about like the models part of stats model. They just sort of talked about the formula part. Um, so the modeling API is still sort of from the data frames age and it's not great. Um, it, that needs a lot of work. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so that's all. Um, thanks for coming and uh, hope you learned something. And um, if you have questions, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear them and, and please reach out.